I remember not too long ago hearing a story of a little boy who fell out of his bed in the middle of the night. And he's laid there on the floor. He kind of had a stunned look on his face. Just shock, I guess, more than anything else. And his dad came in there and he said, son, what happened? He said, I guess, dad, I just, I fell asleep in the bed too close to where I got in. Meaning I was sleeping too close to the edge of the bed and I just, I fell out. I wasn't really in far enough to be falling asleep. It's real easy for many of us to get involved in a project. And in fact, if you watch any Facebook ads, just scroll through some time and look for the ones that say sponsored up there right under the name. And what you'll notice about a lot of those that are sponsored is that the promise of what they're offering you, the, the service, the training, the product, the book, the webinar, the seminar, the skill set that they want to train you in. The promise is that you will make a lot of money. Now, I can tell you from my own experiences that it's nice to have money. Right? You might even have your own experience to have determined that brave and brilliant statement. It's nice to have money. John Maxwell says it like this, I've both had money and I've had no money. And I found that having money is better. It's not the answer, but it's better. He also said though that wealth really does nothing more than change your choices. It gives you an option for different choices than one you had before. That's pretty significant when you stop and think about it. All money does is change your choices because you have options you didn't have before. But if what you do is driven by the idea that you will become rich doing it, I'm going to make more money. I'm going to sell more books. I'm going to sell more people into my webinars. I'm going to, then what you'll find yourself doing is moving from project to project to project to project based on which one will make the most money or build the most notoriety or build your platform faster or, 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 or. But it's not what you do, whether you sell books or you sell DVDs or you sell training seminars or you sell online web webinars or you sell online, course, online courses or you sell landscaping or you sell beauty products or you sell vacations or you sell nail salons or you sell nutrition. It doesn't matter what it is that you sell. If you're driven to sell by the idea that doing so will make you wealthy, then what you're actually doing is finding something to prostitute for money. You've converted that commodity into a money-making tool. And in our capitalist society, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, if entrepreneurialism is as powerful as I believe it is, to free people into living the life that they want to, there's nothing wrong with that with one tiny exception. And that is if everything that drives you to do what you do is driven only by the amount of money, then when you run that course for a little while and you sell that book or you do that landscape or you get that next client on a vacation, the only thing that drives you to do it again is making more money the next time. And what you'll seldom ask yourself is, why do I do this? Now, I can tell you from the number of self-help and self-improvement and leadership and entrepreneurial webinars, seminars, and classes and courses and books that I've studied. When most people talk about their why, in fact, I, I saw a gentleman do it this weekend. When he talked about his why, why, why do I do what I do? Even his why was self-motivated. You heard me. He said, here's the picture of my wife and my kids and my nice car and my ranch and blah, blah, blah. And this is why I do what I do so that I can afford to have the things that I have and to take care of the people that I take care of. And that's good. It's not great, but it's good. I will tell you, though, that if your motivation stops there, then the quality of the product, the quality of the service, the quality of the information that you offer to others 
really will be no better than what it has to be in order to close the next sale because really what you're after, it may not be the exchange of money. It may not be the $15 for the book or the $99 for the webinar or the $300 for the online course or the $3,000 for the coaching program. It may not be the $500 for the tree trimming or the, the $3,000 annual maintenance contract to take care of your trees and your lawn and your grass and your sprinklers or it may not be the $100 hair color job. It may not be just that transaction of, of changing money for service, changing money for a product. It may be the next level of good that says, I don't want to just trade that money for the, that, that service for the $100 for the hair color and take that $100 and, and, and go spend $100 on me. I, I want to spend it on my, my daughter who's struggling with cancer. I, I want to make that transaction to, to trim all the trees on your property and, and bring home $1,000 because I, I want to take my wife on a vacation. And again, those are good. But let me ask you, wouldn't the next level of greatness be that what you do that just happens to bring money? I, again, I have no objections with money. I have no objections with, with doing well while doing good. I have no objections to taking good care of your family. In fact, I, I think there's a phrase for a man who doesn't take good care of his family. He's called a fool. But a man who is taking care of his family and taking care of his obligations and at the same time doing good for the community. There's a, a whole nother level of greatness and you may never become uber wealthy or mega well known. You may not have a platform the size of Anthony Robbins or John Maxwell. But the impact in the people that you serve, not just your why at home, your family, your kids, your friends, your possessions, your lake house, your four-wheeler, your boat, your off-road buggy that you keep in the garage just so you can go out and play on the weekends. That's not a why. It, it may be what you do with the resources that you generate, but if that's your driving why, then the people who are being served by what you do are basically second-class citizens. They are not just clients. They are a means to an end and not much more. What if the reason you do what you do was driven by the opportunity, the potential, the prospect of improving the quality of the life of the people around you? This weekend, as we got to church, there's a, a gentleman who recently read my newest book. Uh, the book is The Five Battle Strategies of the Victorious Warrior. It was just released October 14th uh, on Amazon. And he, had, he read an advanced copy and I just asked him, what do you think of it? And he sent me back a text message in wee hours in the morning and he said, I couldn't put it down. I, I read it from cover to cover in a matter of like six hours. And I was like, well, I, I thought it was a longer read than that. He said, oh, I'll, I'll read it again. In fact, I wanna go through the entire workbook process and answer every question and really let it soak into me. But he said, I'm telling you, this book is like, it's like nothing I've ever seen. It is a new cutting edge in Christian spiritual warfare. And this guy's probably in his mid to late seventies, retired fighter pilot. He's a great guy. Also a very well read guy. Still reads probably more books than I do. So he had purchased, I think he's up to over a dozen copies, but every time he buys them and I deliver the stack to him, before we finish our gathering together, he's given most of those away. Well, a young lady had wandered into the bookstore and he was talking to her. And he was talking to her at the table behind us and he just mentioned to me, hey, if you have some more books in your truck, I need to buy another stack. And so I went out to the truck and I brought them back in for him and I gave them to him. And I had also given him a copy of Karen's book, my wife, The Five Battle Positions of a Happy Wife. And my book is about how to overcome addiction. And it's a book on spiritual warfare and, and mental processing to overcome addiction. My addiction was pornography. Well, my wife was the victim, if you will, of having to walk through the first 10 years of our marriage while I was addicted. And so her book is the positional journal, the five battle positions that, that God walked her through to give her strength to stay for our marriage when her husband wasn't worth fighting for. And so I had just, I included a copy of that on the tack of books. I gave them to him, I went back to my coffee and we're just sitting there chatting. And when I got up to refill my coffee cup, he looked at me and he said, is there any chance that your wife would come over and say hi to this young lady? 
And he just very briefly told me her story. And so when I got back to the table, I mentioned it to Karen and she got up, went over and they were having a nice conversation. And when he left, he left her the one copy of Karen's book. And as he was walking out, we were just kind of laughing and joking. And he walked out and he had our, so when I gave him the stack of books, somebody else said, hey, can I see that? I showed it to him and they gave me money for the book. I'm like, I've already sold that. And they're like, okay, well, I guess I'll buy it from him at a profit. And I'm like, I'll just get him another one from the car and replace his. Don't worry about it. But that seems to happen every time he gets them. So the woman is standing there talking to Karen. He leaves the copy of the book with her and walks out the door. And she's like, what am I supposed to do with this now? And we were able to say to her, he bought it for you. And literally tears started to stream down her face. And she just said, I, I, I would have never had the courage to ask for that. And the impact that that book will have on her life, I truly believe, will be life-changing for her. Just the snippet of her story that I heard, that book will give her so much freedom and so much strength to stand that it will be mind boggling. Now, the $10 exchange of the value of the book and, and who actually paid for it and, and did I replace the book? Yes, I replaced the book that he had purchased. And so in the end, Karen and I gave her the book, but all she knows is she had a book in her hand because someone else paid for it and she didn't have to. And that touched her heart. I think the content of the book will touch her heart even more. Why do we do what we do? We don't do what we do because of the, the transactional value of selling a book or not selling a book. We've probably given away more than we've sold. And we just crossed the 150 mark for the release of October the 14th. We're about to run out of the ones we have. I have just enough to get through the men's conference uh, this week. Hopefully that'll be enough to get me through, but we'll have to make another order. Not because selling books is what we're all about but because changing lives is what we're all about. I want to see families restored. I want to see dads who've been addicted to something and, and thought about leaving their home come back home. I want to see wives who've looked at their husband and said, I can't stand your addiction anymore. Get out. Say, we have a reason to fight. And now we have the tools to do it. Not against each other, but back to back fighting with each other. That's why we do what we do. Today, you'll notice I have a tie on. I almost never have a tie on in these morning videos. The reason I have a tie on today is because as soon as I'm done with this video, myself and a gentleman who's been visiting us this weekend uh, are going to join another team and we'll be working with delegates from the Congolese parliament and government uh, appointed and elected officials who have traveled from the Congo here to the United States. They're actually in Dallas this week and we'll be doing an entire day of training with them on leadership, campaign management, social media strategies, uh, electoral process, leading with ethics and, and basic good government structure, because that's what USALGA does, and that's the organization that I serve with. I'm honored to be a part of that. Not to, not to put the white man's influence into Africa, not to corrupt or manipulate their government, as some might see it, but to instill the power of good, solid leadership in their lives. It's not about the money. It's not about the money that changes hands. It's not about the transaction. It's not about building the platform or growing my knowledge. Or It's not even about the why, while it's still there, of the security of my family and the financial security of my family. It's about the why of looking back to my trips to the Congo so far and seeing the opportunity that rests for young people to rise up, for young people to speak up for young people to live in a different nation than they live in today, for families to be restored, for husbands and wives to be stronger, for young kids to grow up with mom and dad together in the home. That's my why. 23 years ago when Karen and I met, our first conversation was, where do you see yourself in five or 10 or 15 years? What, what do you think you're on this earth for? She'd never heard me answer that question and I'd never heard her answer that question, but our answers were almost identical. I, I wanna fight against divorce. I wanna see families stay together. I wanna see kids grow up in a strong home. That's our why. That's why we do 
what we do. I want to share a little bit with you. This is from uh, John Maxwell's Developing the Leaders Around You. On page 25, he says, uh, there's a story of a tourist who paused for a rest in a small town in the mountains. He went over to an old man sitting on the bench in front of the only store in town and inquired, friend, can you tell me something this town is noted for? Well, replied the old man, I don't rightly know, except it's the starting point to the world. You can start here and go anywhere you want. Not all people view their current location as the starting point to wherever they want to go in the world. We, we as leaders must encourage those around us to see themselves in such a place. And then again on page 28, he says, do big things. Nearly every leader does, nearly everything a leader does hinges on the type of vision he has. If his vision is small, so will his results and followers also. A high-ranking French official who understood this concept once expressed it thus when he addressed when addressing Winston Churchill. Quote, if you are doing big things, you attract big men. If you're doing little things, you attract little men. Little men usually cause trouble. An effective vision attracts winners. Too often, people limit their own potential. They think small. They think they're afraid of risk. People no longer willing to stretch are no longer able to grow. As author Henry Drummond says, unless a man undertakes more than he could possibly do, he will never do all he possibly can. What is your why? Are you limited to paying the bills and meeting your obligations and putting food on the table? Is your why limited to the pleasures of life and the things that immediately surround you? Or do you look out there at the world and say, I want to impact X. You were not made to survive. You were not made to get by. You were not made just to fill a bank account. You were made for so much more than that. You were wired for love and empowered to change the world. You have the creative imagination that it takes to change the impact of the universe. Why do you do what you do? That's my question for you today. I hope you'll take time to ponder it and answer it. Honestly, is it all about you? Or is it about the impact you could have outside of you? I'm J. Lauren Norris, and you've been watching Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.